The reading this morning is from Luke chapter 10, beginning at verse 38, and can be found on page 1042 of the Church Bibles. Luke chapter 10, starting at verse 38. As Jesus and his disciples were on their way, he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. She had a sister called Mary, who sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he said. But Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. She came to him and asked, Lord, Don't you care that my sister has left me to do the work by myself? Tell her to help me. Martha, Martha, the Lord answered, you are worried and upset about many things, but only one thing is needed. Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken away from her. This is the word of the Lord. Right, we'll just pray for Leslie as she brings us the word. Father God, we just thank you for Leslie. And I just pray, Lord, that the word she brings, that you will bless her and that we are receptive to what you are trying to tell us. Open our spirits to receive. Come and anoint Leslie afresh, that she too may be empowered and blessed. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Anne. Thank you, Juliet. (laughs) Good morning. Um, This piece of scripture is from the Gospel of Luke. Each of the four books are written in different styles to different audiences from different points of view and with different emphasis on certain aspects of Jesus' life and ministry. Luke's Gospel is the longest of the four Gospels, and it highlights the ministry of the Holy Spirit and pays particular attention to women, children, the poor, and the oppressed. So today we're going to look at two women, Martha and Mary, M and M. The passage sits between the Good Samaritan and the disciples asking Jesus to teach them how to pray. They were on a journey of learning and discovery, much like us. I have a confession this morning. Well, actually, I have two. You know, when you're asked to come and preach, you can choose what you would like to talk about. Or you can use a reading from a book called The Lectionary. And that just gives you a choice of a few things that you can speak about. And I went to the lectionary and saw Luke 10, Martha and Mary. And I thought, I'm going to do that because everybody knows about Martha and Mary. I knew that I'd done some study notes on it before, so job done. (laughs) Have you ever thought that? And then so realise that God wants something else. You know, I went home and I found my notes and I'm going through them and it's like, I just knew that I wasn't supposed to use them. Because God wants something else from us, doesn't he? As we journey with him, he wants a bit more. So in my moment of job done, I kind of learnt a lesson. That that way of thinking is not God's thinking. My second confession is that today's sermon is embellished. Hopefully not in a wishy-washy way, but I wanted to fill in some of the gaps with something that was plausible. You know, you'll go away with your own questions, hopefully, and maybe you'll come to other conclusions. The majority of the women in the Bible are revealed to us in in just passing hints. None of them are actually fully pictured as we would like. And that makes it quite difficult when you want to 
try and build some sort of a structure around a piece of scripture. Us ladies will probably be familiar with the name Francine Rivers. She's an American author and she's written quite a lot of books, fictional books, on, based around women in the Bible. All I can say, Francine, is respect. Real respect to actually put together a novel on such limited information. I guess that we're all fairly familiar with this passage. We've heard about Martha and Mary. We kind of remember some of it. We know some of it. We remember that Martha served. We remember that Mary sat at Jesus' feet. We remember that Martha complained. And we remember some of the words that Jesus said to her. Martha, Martha, you are worried about many things. All we actually know about Martha comes from three passages in the Gospel describing three separate events. Firstly, we have this occasion that we're reading about today. When it says that Jesus stays at what is described as Martha's home, presumably with his disciples, And Jesus gently chides Martha for being preoccupied with the tasks that lay before her. Secondly, there is the story of raising Lazarus, her brother from the dead. There we learn that they live in a village called Bethany, a couple of miles from Jerusalem. And that Jesus loved Martha and Mary, which kind of implies that they were well known to him. And finally, we are told of the meal at Bethany held in Jesus' honour a few days before his death. Lazarus sits at the table with Jesus, Martha serves, and Mary anoints Jesus' feet with an expensive perfume. There does seem to be a few possible connections to Simon the leper, but nothing substantial that gives a definite link. In the Gospel of Mark, the house where Mary poured the expensive perfume over Jesus' feet, it it refers to it as the house of Simon the leper. But whether that is the same house that we're talking about today, it's not substantiated. On all three occasions, Martha serves. The implication from the Gospels is that Jesus stayed in Bethany the week leading up to his death. So it's possible that this little family, these three siblings were close by during the events that unfolded during that week. How close they were, what they saw, how much they saw, we don't know. But I think it's fairly true to say that it seems that they would have been witnesses to some of what happened. In the passage that Juliet read today, We don't know why Martha opened her home to Jesus, and we don't know what prompted her. There is such little background on these three siblings. They may have been well-to-do orphans who had the management of their own home, since there doesn't seem to be any mention of parents. The eldest of the three seems to be Martha, and she seems to be in control of the household. Were they fairly affluent? They certainly had a house large enough to accommodate many people as their hospitality to Jesus and his disciples on this occasion shows. There's no mention of occupations. Yet Mary had a very expensive perfume called Nard. In John 12, it tells us that the house was filled with perfume. And Judas Iscariot remarked that the nard would have been worth a year's wages. This young girl, as we think she was, how did she acquire something like that? There was a possible link, vague possible link, to relations possibly being perfumiers. But once again, nothing conclusive. You come to a lot of dead ends when you start studying stuff. You know, none appeared to be married. 
And that was unusual in Jewish society, where people normally married quite young, perhaps before the age of 20. So we're going to assume that these three people were possibly in their teens. So we have a passage that is a tiny, tiny sliver of scripture. And it doesn't really give that much away, does it? Other than on the surface, it appears that Martha got it wrong and Mary got it right. But is that what it's about? Let's have a look at the two sisters. You know, Martha's decision to host Jesus and the disciples involved a sacrifice on her part. It meant that she would be doing perhaps a lot of the work involved in preparing the food for such a large group of people. Having kind of 13, 14, 15 people all come at once is a lot, isn't it? Especially when they're not invited or previously invited. It meant that she had to be willing to part with some of her food stores. Food stores that she had no doubt accumulated with some effort. She must have been very responsible, and I guess industrious, to have such a large supply of food that she was willing to share with others. I see Martha as confident. A confident confident young woman in opening a house, confident that she could manage feeding such a large group of people. Confident and capable, I think I would use for Martha. And it got me thinking about food. It's always a good subject, isn't it? You know, part of the problem here was that Martha was stuck in the kitchen. Not a takeaway in sight. No Just Eat app. Bicycle hadn't been invented. No Deliveroo on the horizon. None of this kitchen diner stuff, this entertaining space that we read about today. It's hard to determine what Martha's house or this house would have been like. But in general terms, it may have had a central courtyard with different rooms running off of it. There would have been some sort of area to cook in. Maybe some of that was inside. Some, sometimes part of it was outside. There may have been an area for animals, if they had any. There may have been a small area to grow vegetables and herbs. You know, their growing seasons would have been important because it didn't only mean food for current use. It meant having a supply of food that would see them through the rest of the year. Part of their life was based around growing and cultivating, preparing and preserving food. And a lot of their time would have been spent ensuring that there was adequate food stock. Not like us lazy lot these days, where it's kind of on tap 24-7, isn't it? You know, Mary, on the other hand, what do we know about her? She seems to be the youngest in the family. And it's really difficult to put an age on her. Again, we only encounter Mary three times in the Bible. Firstly, in this passage where she sits at Jesus' feet. Secondly, in the Gospel of John, when Lazarus had died, it says, when Mary reached the place where Jesus was and she saw him, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you had been there, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. And thirdly, we see Mary just days before the crucifixion where despite the criticism, she broke that alabaster jar open and poured that expensive oil over Jesus' head and feet. On all three occasions, Mary sat at Jesus' feet. This young lady, maybe still a child, didn't feel compelled to defend herself in the face of criticism over this expensive bottle of perfume. She'd got a purpose. She was determined, and she was going to do what she set out to do. Spirited is a word I would use for Mary. So we have a tiny little glimpse of 
the two sisters, where we think they lived, how we think they lived. You know, the obvious lesson here is priority. That in the midst of our busy days and our busy schedules, sitting with Jesus is that necessary thing. That good part that Jesus is talking about. And while we would all agree with that, you know, we all kind of sit there and think, yeah. Do we actually practice it? There's a question. You know, good intentions aren't enough, are they? And it's a proven fact that habits take time to develop. You know, when we start something, we start with enthusiasm, don't we? We're going to do this. We've got a plan. And I remember doing a home study probably 18 months ago of Exodus, and I went through Exodus with gusto. I love Exodus. I fell in love with Moses. I kind of limped along in Leviticus, but I completely died in numbers. <laughs> you know, my motivation went. That habit just went. But why is sitting at Jesus' feet necessary? Why is reading our Bible or praying or coming to church, worshipping, talking to other Christians important? You know, the word provides us with the very wisdom of God that we need for direction, for decisions. The word puts us in communion with him. The word helps us to put life's precious into perspective. And that word is that good part, that good part that cannot be taken away from us because it lasts forever. 2 Timothy says all scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for everything. You know, we can lose about anything in life, but you don't lose the time that you spend with God. We can lose our jobs, we can lose our money, our possessions, friendships. But Paul says in Romans 8 that nothing, no tribulation, No distress or persecution, famine, nakedness, peril, sword, not even death itself can separate us from the love of God. You know, who on their deathbed says, I wish I'd spent more time at work? Most people towards the end of their life would say, I wish I'd have spent more time on relationships. That time's gone then, isn't it? This passage speaks of balance and a a big buzzword today and has been for a few years is that home work-life balance. And there's abundance of stuff out there, isn't there? If you've got a mobile phone, you can get an app that helps you keep life in balance. You've got to tap the app and life is sorted. (laughs) You know, my heart sunk a few weeks ago when I went into a really well-known bookshop and I went to the religious section and it was like two shelves on the bottom. I would say there were two shelves of religious books. The books that were above it, I would really query if they were religious. But it was the section next to it that took my eye. One, it was huge and one, it had a heading of self-help. So today we are to self-help. And that's not what God wants from us, is it? You know, we journey with God. It's not about self-help. You know, we can all relate to Martha's outburst, can't we? In the ideal world and with hindsight, we would handle situations a bit different at times, wouldn't we? 
we would be speaking about something completely different today. If Martha had gently gone up to Mary and just prodded her and said, come on you, I need a bit of help in the kitchen. I'm struggling. You know, if you come as well, then we can get it done quicker. And I can sit at Jesus' feet. But as we know, she didn't. Scripture says that she went straight to Jesus and she said to him, you care that my sister has left me to do all the work and tell her. You know, it's interesting when you read that in a different way, when you slow it down and when you condense it. Because what she was saying and what she did is she went straight to Jesus and said, don't you care? Don't you care? Three words. It says a lot, doesn't it? If somebody was to come to you and say, don't you care? It's a big thing, isn't it? She also said, tell her. Tell her. You know, what happened to Martha in that kitchen? That's the one question that bugged me when I looked at this again. What happened to Martha in that kitchen? This confident, capable young lady snapped. And it's a familiar story to all of us, isn't it? When you feel that someone doesn't care, it touches on something, doesn't it? At that moment in time, Martha felt overwhelmed. And I guess on her own. And that's a really lonely place to be. What started off as a lovely gesture in welcoming Jesus into her home and wanting to serve turned into something else. You know, the action was directed at Jesus in a very direct way. She was angry, possibly with herself. Maybe, maybe... Martha wanted to do it all herself. Maybe the issue here ended up being Martha's lesson. Maybe there was a bit of pride and control going on that she could do it all. And as she worked in the kitchen that day, she realised that she was paying the price for that. I mean, we don't know, do we? She was angry with Mary, but Jesus got both barrels. Sound familiar? She wanted somebody to care. There was a house full of people and it seemed that no one noticed. I think Martha probably had high standards. Perhaps she was alarmed that she was falling behind in her duties and things were taking longer than expected. And she admitted to herself that she needed help. There was a longing to sit and listen at Jesus' feet just like her sister was doing, but there were still many things to do. Tell her to help me. I mean, it's a cry for help, really, isn't it? You know, neither of these phrases or these outbursts are familiar to us in our everyday lives, are they? But it's Jesus' response that's interesting. I love this bit you can kind of get a sense that Martha's got a bit of a strop on and she's gone up to Jesus. And I sense this calmness that always surrounded him. Kind of brings it down, doesn't it? You are worried and upset about many things. The upset was obvious by Martha's actions, but the worry went a bit deeper, didn't it? You are worried about many things. You know, Jesus knew he was not and he is not oblivious to our many things. However brave and however confident we act in day-to-day matters, when we are worried about many things, it eventually comes to the surface. Perhaps in a behaviour that's not great. Perhaps in unkind and unnecessary words. You know, if we ever get this way, and we do, 
Listen to this. My frustrated and confused friend, are you at the corner of life where you don't know which way to turn? Then for goodness sake, sit down. Sit down. Sit at Jesus' feet. Look at his word and see what he has to say. I love that. You know, the lovely thing about this scripture, as always, is that beautiful way that Jesus speaks to Martha. He doesn't scold her or condemn her for for trying to be a good hostess. You know, serving was and is a good thing. It's a necessary part of our ministry. He was being very tactful as always in gently saying to her that she had allowed herself to become overwhelmed. It's as true now as it was then. This busy world we operate in isn't always great, is it? You know, from this little sliver of scripture... We learn that cares of this life can be dangerous, even when they seem to be most lawful and commendable. Nothing of a worldly nature could have been more proper than to provide for the Lord Jesus and supply his wants. But Martha's kindness and duty had turned into something else. It had become bigger than it should have been, and it took away that good part Have we lost sight of what's important? Are we too busy doing many things to have time for God? Is our work for the Lord causing us to be anxious and troubled? If so, then we have forgotten the reason why we are serving God in the first place. There was a survey commissioned by the Church of England in 2017. It showed 55% of people who identify as Christians never read the Bible. 29% never pray. 33% never go to church. And only 6% of adults in Britain said that they were practicing Christians. What percentage do you fall in? You know, not everyone is willing to obey God and pay the price required to be close to him. Intimacy with God requires an investment of time. And not everyone is willing to invest the same amount of time. You know, God doesn't want all of our time, but he does ask to be kept in first place at all times. Some people think the only way to be close to God is to do nothing but spiritual things. However, God designed us with a body, a soul, and a spirit. And he expects us to take care of each part. If we keep God first, then everything we do can be spiritual. Even something like cooking a meal can be an act of worship. If we do it unto the Lord and for his glory. You know, in conclusion, We have Martha and we have Mary, two women, sisters. Are you Mary or are you Martha? Martha's thoughtful. Sorry, Mary's thoughtful, Martha's active. Mary is about being. Martha is about doing. Martha thought she was going to serve Jesus... But Mary chose the good portion. Jesus is our good portion that will never be taken away. A meal is just temporary. But the time with Jesus, that time we spend with him, is a gift that lasts forever. We live in a Martha world where we are troubled and anxious and distracted by many things. But God built this world to be A merry world with Martha moments. When sin entered the world, it turned into a Martha world in which we have to fight for merry moments. The rhythm of our day is supposed to be Mary first and then Martha. 
Spend time with Jesus and then get stuff done. Worship like Mary and work like Martha. Worship God before you work so that you can worship God in your work. We want to have Mary's heart but Martha's hands. Thank you very much. A lot of food for thought.